In this video, I will talk about patterns that we see in nature. One of the objects that we see around us that show a striking pattern would be honeycombs. Have you seen honeycombs in your life? So honeycombs are nests where bees store honey and hide their larvae to protect them. It is made from wax. Wax are fats. And there was a time when, when beeswax, okay, so that's what you call them, the wax. Uh, there was a time when these beeswax were harvested to make candles. You know what? The thought that a honeycomb is constructed in this way, constructed using the shape of a regular polygon, is fascinating when you are thinking of it. But the truth of the matter is, when you see an actual honeycomb, I don't know about you, but me, when I see an actual honeycomb, what I feel is disgust. I find the thing disgusting. I experience an irrational fear and disgust for the tiny holes that you would find in honeycomb. And they have a word for that. You call it tripophobia. But the thought that they are made from tiny hexagons is fascinating enough that they had the attention of mathematicians ever since the days of the ancient Greeks. What is fascinating about hexagons is hexagon is one of the three regular polygon which you can use to produce a regular tessellation. A tessellation is something like this. You have, you have a plane and you want to cover it with polygons. But you want to cover it with polygons in such a way that the polygons will not overlap and there will be no gaps between the polygons. And there are three polygons or regular polygons that can do that. That would be the triangles, the squares, and one of them would be the hexagons. And honeycombs are constructed using regular hexagons. There was one mathematician who is so fascinated by this, and he made this comment. Bees must be imbued with natural wisdom because they knew that hexagon is the polygon that holds the, the largest space in which to store honey given a limited quantity of beeswax. You know what? Problems like that abound in applied mathematics. You call it optimization. Given that you have in your possession a limited quantity of beeswax, beeswax to make these uh, compartments, what would be the best shape of the compartment? Or what would be the best shape of, uh, of the holes such that it can hold the largest quantity of honey. That kind of problem abound in applied math and we call it optimization. Snowflakes. I have not seen a snowflake in my life. So these are icicles. So these are small ice formed around suspended dusts and they show self-repeating patterns. So snowflakes show this thing which we call fractals. They show self-repeating patterns. When you look at the small, small parts of it, the small parts seem to be a tiny reproduction of the bigger parts of the snowflake. Fractals. Uh, this is what I said earlier. Fractals are objects whose smaller parts look similar to the larger parts of the object. I have not seen icicles in my life. But what I had seen are balls of ice. I experienced seeing balls of ice falling from the sky. And I thought, hey, uh, are we in the United States now? Are we in Canada now? But we are not in those places. We are right here in Batangas. When I was a kid, I experienced balls of ice falling from the sky. And it was not an amusing experience. Well, the initial thought of it is kind of amusing. But when we saw the size of the eyes, they were as big as golf balls. They are no longer amusing when balls like that can hurt you. So again, fractals are objects whose smaller parts look similar to the larger parts of the object. And that is precisely the experience that we see when we look at a mountain. You know what? When I was a kid, I liked to play with toy soldiers. Toy soldiers and so... In my mind, the soldiers will hide 
in the mountain, but the mountain is, is just a mound of soil. But when you look at that mound from afar, or, or even closer, they in fact look like something like this. They look like mountains. So mountains show the phenomenon of fractals, of self-similarity. Trees also show the phenomenon of self-similarity. When you look at one branch, it is a reproduction of the other branches in the tree. The same with lightning. Look at one arm of the lightning. In fact, each arm of the lightning seems to be a reproduction of the other arms or branches of the lightning. It's the same with the roots of trees. It's the same with the blood vessels, with the nerves and veins inside our body. Each branch is somewhat like a reproduction of the other branches in the system. The same with the sky. When you look at one section of the sky, the rest are copies. In fact, you can produce this same picture in your computer by copying one section and then pasting it all over the screen of your computer and you will produce something like this, something close to this. Now, this one is not a pattern to be found in nature because this is an environment or a pattern that can be seen only in a gaming environment. Well, if you were to look at it, there are things here that are similar with one another. So an artist did this, but it's not, it's not in the manner that you might be thinking because a digital artist will not paint this whole thing one by one. What he would do is he will paint, he or she will only paint four or five objects. A sphere, a sample of the water, this flying object, that sky, and what else? And this, and, and this clouds. He will only paint small small pictures of these objects, of those objects. And what the artist would do is he would copy and paste them all over the screen. And of course, he would modify them. So this one, this picture actually takes advantage of self-similarity. You don't draw the whole thing as if each thing is unique. You only draw few objects and then you copy and reproduce those objects in the entire canvas.